sure. Can I check that you can hear me? I think everybody can. Yep. Yes. Definitely. Good. My name is Judith O'Driscoll, and I'm head of compliance and risk at S&P Dow Jones Indices. We're a division of S&P Global. Uh, we went through a significant merger this year with IHS Market. Um, that occurred on the 1st of March. And that may play into some of the comments I'll have later on. <laughs> Very because good. Because we're in post-merger organisation. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, if I can throw that to Mark as well. Yes, my name is Mark Leipold. Um, I've been engaged with uh, risk and compliance for the uh, best part of 20 years now. Um, I've been in the works of implementing GRCs uh, as a CRO, as a head of non-financial risk, and currently as an advisor uh, to a bank that we may talk about uh, uh, later or in the break. Um, currently, my role is a very interesting one. I, I don't have a formal role in uh, the process, but I've been hired as a challenger, uh, in the words of the CRO, as a challenger to everybody, to the uh, to metric stream, to the implementer, uh, to the team, and even to the CRO uh, herself. So basically, I'm there to challenge every step of the way of the process. I do hope you got that role in writing so you could uh, do it justice. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. And uh, last but definitely not least, Adrian. Yeah, sure. Uh, all the best risk people are challengers, though. That's, that's all. Bread and butter. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Aid Furness. Uh, I work at Lloyd's Banking Group. I've been there for just shy of 18 years, the last six of which have been focused in our conduct, compliance, and operational risk division. Uh, I've done a number of roles across first and second line. Uh, my focus at the moment is on two primary things. Firstly, I run our payments risk practice. It's not really a risk, but payments oversight practice, I should say. Uh, and I look after our uh, strategy reporting and planning function for non-financial risk. So that's trying to wrestle with what does our, the future of our, of, our, of, our, um, of our team look like? How do we operate? What are the good things we need to look at and why? Uh, and bringing everyone in the team along with us on that journey. Uh, uh, and our risk function overall in Lloyd's is around uh, 3,000 people covering a lot of second line stuff and the CCOR, as we call it, function is around 350 of us. So that's the brief intro. Excellent. And, and perhaps we can flow on from, from that, that same position of, in terms of today, talk about your kind of top, top issues, whether risk compliance combination. Um, you want me to? So, yes. so I think... There's a few ways of answering this. So there's the kind of macro stuff that we're all thoughtful about, and then I'll get into some sort of meat and potatoes of some of the specific things now, and perhaps on the emerging risk. So um, a lot, of, a lot of it. When I was when I was thinking through my notes, actually, a lot of the conversations we've had, certainly in this room and the other room today, really, really mean a lot to me. They makes complete sense. So the first thing says the interconnectedness of risk in general as a trend of, of things that are happening. It's on my mind. I don't I don't have a golden bullet answer to any of that. I don't think any of us do. But being aware of that interconnectedness and trying to turn ourselves as risk professionals into more holistic risk managers, yes, have specialism, my specialism in payments, but I've got to have a broad brush approach to operational conduct and compliance risk, so, so that. And then for, for me, more specifically in Lloyd's, one of the things I'm really thoughtful about is how do we operate a risk function in a growth environment? So for those that have, have been keeping up the press with Lloyd's, we, we the last 10 or 12 years, have really been focused on risk control and mitigation under a chap called Antonio Horta Rosario. He moved on a year or so ago. Charlie Nunn's come in. He's implementing a growth strategy into the organization. How does risk management look different in a growth strategy? Again, feel free to pop some answers on a postcard. <laughs> uh, I'm sat at the back there. I'd appreciate those. Um, I said I'd get into the meat and potatoes. So um, I'll keep this like top three things. Right? So there's the kind of now, here and now, BAU, as we call it, risk management the things that are important to us, and they're not surprising. We've talked about them all today in different lenses. IT systems, uh, cyber security, and to a lesser extent today, but broadly sourcing, so third parties. Those are the, those are the three top risks we at Lloyd's Banking Group are facing into at the moment. Um, they're reasonably well managed, but even the residual assessments of those risks and the control environment it remains relatively high, and it's a very dynamic environment. In terms of emerging risks, so you know, peering around the corner, what does the future look like? Again, there's a long list of 11 of these that we've assessed quite deeply over the last few months. The top three very much revolve around data as, as number one, uh, climate-related responsibilities as number two, and then consumer propositions and societal expectations as number three. Now, one more second on what, what that means. So mm -hmm. data is not about compliance with data regulations anymore. That, that is, in my head at least anyway, 
what we the minimum standard things like we've, we've talked heard about PCBS 239 GDPR these are things now that exist we must just carry on comply with that is normal now um, this is about ethics uh, ethical use of AI real data positive exploitation of data for the good of customers um, and I'm sure we'll talk about things yeah, like we'll come back to that. Oh, that's, I'll, I'll pause there. Uh, no ex excellent so so we're shifting shifting into a growth mode um, and the implications of that and not necessarily all the answers so if I go down the line to Judith, you mentioned in, in your introduction in terms of the fact that you're going through mergers, in a different style, a very changing landscape. Perhaps you can talk about the, the now in, in that, sure. that merger process. So I'm, we're experiencing, or I'm experiencing, mergers in several dimensions. We've just merged risk and compliance. And I'm finding that a fascinating experience. I, I start, I'm, a, I'm more of a compliance professional than risk. Um, although I guess I've done risk in various guises in my career. Um, I, I looked at that merger of merging risk and compliance with a degree of scepticism, but uh, after three months in, I, I'm actually finding it very helpful. Uh, I'm finding it very helpful to have a risk lens and the risk taxonomy and the risk jargon, uh, bringing it to the compliance space to help it land more effectively with the business. So you're, um, you're, you're specific seeing almost that, that evolution of, of an operation because of the, the merger now. Yeah. A and turning it on its head, would the converse be, say, from the, the risk side, and it, whether it's, it's peers or in terms of process, do you see that enhancing? So I see risk as becoming more aware of compliance and <laughs> regulatory risk. Yeah. Much more aware, much more attuned. Um, more involved, more educated, perhaps. Um, so certainly the, the marriage is a good one. I think we're off to a good start. Yeah. So that's the, that's the immediate merger. And then there's our organizational merger, um, merging to very different cultures um, who had their own risk profiles um, and now trying to understand the depth of both harmonizing the risk profiles. That's mm -hmm. uh, an exercise we're going through at the moment. Absolutely fascinating. Um, harmonizing the approach to regulatory compliance. Um, that requires a lot of uh, attention and hand-holding. Hand-holding our regulators to a degree to educate them on, well, who is this new firm that we haven't really dealt with before? We've, we're used to dealing with this firm, and now we've got Mm. you across the table from us. So there's a lot of ed mutual education going on. Um, at a time when we're in this economic, you know, economic climate uh, that brings its own pressure to bear. Um, and we have staff who you know, are, are experiencing a merger as well. So they're, yeah. they're experiencing it on all fronts, which raises its own, uh, its own risks. Like you've got, you have to need to think about key man risk, you need to think about culture risk, yeah. technology merger risk, uh, cyber risk, et cetera, et cetera. Every time you think of risks, you need to think of them twice. Understood. And then figure out if that's the case or when are we going to harmonize it so that we're just looking at you know, a risk in one dimension. Very interesting. Very interesting. So, so if, if, you, if you were to journey. take, I mean, the, 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 there is is clearly two discrete disciplines there, but of the observation of the, the biggest hurdle, perhaps beyond cultural, have you seen anything beyond that that, you know, it is now some, a plan to remedy it in terms of any, anything observed? We're just merging two technologies for a company that deals with a lot of data. But the two companies yeah. are very data intensive um, and merging our technologies to enable us to merge our data and share our data that that is it's not it's not a surprise but it's just something we're working through sure right? it there's no single flip of a yeah. switch understood yeah. thank you mark uh, with possibly a slightly different perspective from from, from an external um, point of view mm -hmm. or consultative point of view tell me more about what you're seeing and i suppose what your clients are, are talking to you about Right. Okay. I, I think this slot allows for a little bit of uh, 
blue sky thinking. Uh, so <laughs> let me try to throw a spanner in the works uh, with a bit of a challenging uh, start. First of all, I, I've heard the speeches this morning. I think it's all wonderful. I think we all recognise a lot of it in terms of you know, cutting through silos, getting to harmonised approaches and these sort of things. Um, let me say that I find there's a little bit too much agreement on that. And that's not just because we all share the same experience, but I think we're, we're missing something there that I think is going to happen. One of the things that I think is definitely needs to happen, and if it doesn't happen, uh, more shame to us uh, as risk professionals, I think is that risk management really needs to be taken serious by the risk takers. So much of what we're doing in non-financial risk and compliance and uh, even IT security risk and, and, and cyber risk is basically catering to our own audience. But we need to also be taken serious by the risk takers. And that means we need to be at the table where the decisions are being made. And I challenge you in your own organizations how much of that non-financial risk data that you're gathering is actually being used by decision takers in their decisions. And so as a, as a lifeline, I would say, let's try to be a bit more um, ambitious and try to get rid of this non-financial risk epithet and try to merge with credit risk, market risk, liquidity risk to make sure that it has an equal seat at the table when the decisions are being made. And that is where I see a big challenge happening because most credit decisions are purely credit decisions. Most um, decisions made in the risk committees don't start by looking at the non-financial risk aspect. So I think the challenge for us is to make sure that we do get a seat on that decision table. Uh, and to, to throw potentially a, a solution uh, question at you, what, what's your mind of how that could be done in terms of what you think needs to change in order to make that happen? Okay, so there'll be different uh, answers to that spinning around in your head. One of them may be <laughs> quantification, because the moment we quantify, it gets easier to be taken on board. But quantification is really, really difficult. I think the unique value non-financial risk has is that it tries to help understand risk, uh, try to understand the mechanisms, try to understand which controls are effective, try to understand which is a crucial aspect of any decision-making element. So I don't think we should try to jump into the space of better quantification, which, if it works, fine, but I think we'll have a challenge in a lot of aspects to quantify in a meaningful way, and maybe to best help in terms of helping the decision-makers understand the impact of their decisions. Understood. And, and perhaps if I... If you... If, if you if, I was going to say... Would you like to, to give me your thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, coiled spring, spring on that. Um, so I, I agree with your agitation, actually. I think it's, it's a really tricky one. I think um, I, I do think metrics and data is really important, but I, I, get, I get your point there. I think having clarity on uh, what we're reporting, why we're reporting it, and the, um, to use a word from an earlier presentation, the fidelity of that, I think, is, is really important. The other thing I'd, I would mention briefly, and it's something we're, we're literally wrestling with as we speak, it's something that we're changing in, in my organisation at the moment, is our accountability models. Mm -hmm. um, okay. That's why I agree with you. Say something about if you have clarity and accountability, not just from an SMCR perspective, which is important, but more broadly than that, and if you have accountability particularly, particularly aligned to um, what I would call a customer end-to-end -end perspective, I won't use the word journey, but an end-to-end -end perspective, mm. um, you start to see different decisions being made and, and the call for data being different, or the call for information mm -hmm. being different. So. What, what we're starting to see in its very early days, by changing the accountability from being what I would classify as horizontal, so technology risk being a horizontal accountability in something like an operating office, to a technology risk being accountable in a customer vertical, to use, mm -hmm. if you can imagine that, you know, classic matrix picture. The accountable folk who run the businesses, who previously perhaps haven't worried too much about risk data regarding technology currency or cyber security or data governance, whatever, the, are actually starting to go, oh, hold on, I'm, I'm personally accountable here, or you know, I've got a level of accountability I didn't have before, I need new data, I need new information, I need new understanding, and that accountability shift is starting, we're month one into it, so it's very early, but it's starting to drive different conversations from a, a risk data perspective. So 
So, so by virtue providing that, uh, and in the nicest possible sense, more of a stick to the outcome for those that have got responsibility for it, it's improving the process to drive better outcomes because of it. Is that a reason? It should. It end. should. Yeah. <laughs> dot, yes. dot, dot, dot. Okay. Um, so that, that kind of leads us on, I suppose, as it, that is very much an embryonic start towards that transition. Perhaps we can now truly get the crystal ball out and, and look towards, I mean, I always ask it, sometimes when you said 2023 in, in a conversation, everybody can sit back and go, yeah, sure, no problem. But the pace of change and the fluctuation of change that all of us can earmark to weeks, not even days, is, is, is really, I suppose, where I'm trying to position from, from a question point of view. So uh, looking forward, let's say 12 months from now, if you want to go further, I'm impressed, so please feel free. But 12 months out, what, what's the, the key things on the horizon? What are you thinking about? And, and if I can take that back to, um, to uh, uh, Judith on the end. At 12 months out, gosh. Well, yeah. if, oh, if you want to go. manipulate the question to, 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 to so, suit the answer. It, indeed. So we, we, you know, the things that are on our table now that we're looking at over the next few months are the, it's not going to come as a surprise, data, ESG, we're trying to keep up with what's happening in the ESG space, cyber risk. Those, those are, mm -hmm. I mean, we grapple with them this year, we'll be grappling with them next year, no, no doubt about it. Um, I certainly think AI yep. is, is significant, and then to shift very significantly okay. geopolitical risk, Mm -hmm. uh, keeping an eye for as, as a global organisation, trying to remain on top of what's happening in China, what those regulators are expecting, our own regulators, as they're certainly the feeling is they're they're flexing their muscles. I think they will continue to do that. Mm -hmm. I think if they're 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 flexing them more now is 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 my impression as they come under their own pressure um, from from our own political backdrop. I think. So AI, geopolitical risk, those are areas that will certainly, this, you know, end of next year, we'll be thinking about them for the following year, would, would, be, my, would be my sense. Okay. In addition to the ones that are already on the table <laughs> right. that we we're, know we're, are, I, are I, I totally appreciate we're only adding here, yeah. we're not taking any away. Uh, Mark, what's, what's your thoughts on a similar, similar vein of question? So uh, I'm going to say a little bit closer to home. Yep. Uh, 12 months, I think, is actually not very far out at all. Mm -hmm. It's going to be there far sooner than we think. Yeah. Um, I think 12 months to, let's say, five years out, any bank is going to be a digital bank. All of them. And everything is going to be digitised. Everything will be, in some way or form, interacting with clients, interacting with your investors, interacting with your stakeholders. It's all going to be digital. Which raises the question, how much influence does the CISO have at board level? How much influence does it have at senior management level? Is there anybody out there who actually understands what's going on? And one of the things I'm seeing, and I think this is maybe a good thing, maybe not, uh, is that in a lot of banks, you're seeing a kind of a parallel bank within the bank emerging, where the whole digital business is almost on a parallel track. They've got separate departments looking after themselves. Sometimes they're in different buildings. Uh, they are basically challenging the established bank, which will have continue to have a role, certainly, but the bulk of work is going to be done there. And that, that's also, by definition, then, where the bulk of the risk, I think, is going to be. And the risk is going to be there not because it's complex, but because there's not enough knowledge in the people who are pretending to manage it from a senior level down. At the, at the, at the coal face, there's abundance of knowledge. But as they say, uh, it's sometimes said that the, uh, uh, the tone at the top is the most important. I disagree. I think the tone at the middle is the most important because that's the filter yeah. through which everything goes. And that's where I would put focus my attention uh, for the next well, yeah, five years, to say. Adrian, now, from a principle of, I don't think anybody is necessarily agreeing that two parallel organisational structures 
is the ideal. It's it's okay. almost uh, something that's appropriating out of, of um, necessity, if you will. Mm -hmm. w w what's your thoughts about trying to keep that together from 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 where you sit? Is, is that to Mark's point? Is that almost too difficult to do, or do you have a have a view of keeping it together, or will it? When you say keeping it together, what what, uh, what are you rather than splitting digital from physical, yeah, uh, to paraphrase, yeah, no, no. Um, trying so, to keep this together. So, so, so rather than saying, well, we've now got two factions in order to try and do this from a financial landscape point of view, because the change is so great on a digital side of thing, the investment and the setup is required to almost segregate. Yeah. Is, is, is there a, a, a this so, house believes to try and keep it together and what would you believe that course uh, is? So I would, go, I would go down a, I have to answer this from my own lived experience in FS, so it's no, an right. FS answer, so apologies. <laughs> but I don't think you can separate them, is the point. I think the direction of travel for regulation, the direction of travel for societal expectation, um, the direction of travel from an employee propositional point of view, doesn't enable you to split out and have something that's a sexy digital kind of brand new forward-looking part of an organisation. This isn't a bank like that, any organisation. And the kind of this is the way we used to do things section. If, if I focus in on a regulatory angle, if we think about things like consumer duty and operational resilience, which are two things big in the financial service industry, you know, when we talk about important business services and impact to customers, that's not just the digital question, that's an all, all processes question. Um, you know, it's about how much cash comes out of the cash point. Yes, it's diminishing, but it's still very important that we do it fairly and appropriately. Um, yes, if you're logging on to a brand new all singing and dancing system, it needs to be appropriate. So, I, I, I guess it's a bit of a top of the head, mark, top of my head answer, but I don't think you can create two separate organisations. I think integration of digital with uh, old with new in any context is hard, but great efforts should be made to do it. And I actually. The, the, I kind of agree. I think I do, I do think tone from the top is still very important culturally, um, but I also agree your middle management layer is really where the rubber hits the road on, on all of that. Your, your, your managers, senior managers, or v, VPs, um, SVPs, to really um, drive in that culture. Um, I, I think it's what people in their personal lives will experience and expect from their organisations that we all represent, whatever industry we're part of. Excellent. No, no. Uh, so. Less a better together, but almost Im impossible to, to split apart. Yeah, I, would like that. I just want to touch upon, as I know we're running out of time, and I, I did want to have the audience to have a chance to ask questions. We touched upon AI, um, which is a really interesting space, both in terms of the, the, the applications, but also the fact the increasing observation is that how do you make sure that that is customer facing fair and and ultimately audible, auditable in the, the decision-making process. Um, I know, uh, Judith, you, you, you started with, with a comment on it. In terms of any immediate areas where that is under scrutiny or any other further comments on that, and I'll, I'll share that with the, the rest of the panel in terms of their thoughts of that as a, an emerging space that technology is driving its own in, in, the, in the forging of progress we're creating another area that we need to, to have under uh, control and compliance, if you will. Well, I think we're, we're not there yet. Our organisation is not there yet, but I think our organisation, our technology departments, as they become um, more sophisticated, they will be working in the AI space and thinking about it, and I think it behoves us to have an awareness of it, have our finger on the pulse, yeah. be ready, be in the conversations, um, be educated as risk and compliance professionals. Yeah. I just I feel it's a, an area that Somebody's I don't have to deal with today, <laughs> but I, I need to I need to become educated about and ready for. Yeah. Fair enough. Mark, uh, thoughts from your side? Yes, I'm, I'm a bit more sceptical perhaps on AI. Uh, I do see a lot of machine learning happening uh, and pattern recognition in terms of uh, suggesting investment products, for instance, to targeted audiences. Mm -hmm. That is mostly pattern recognition. I wouldn't call that proper AI. Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't seen AI applications per sung. Uh, um, and just very, very quickly to come back to the whole digitization versus mm -hmm. uh, traditional banking. 
Um, I'm not suggesting for a minute that it's the target to have them separate. Um, it's just the ecology and the evolution of it appears to go that way. Understood. So just yeah. wanted to put no, that absolutely. straight. Absolutely. Good point of clarity. Adrian, just on, on the... Uh, yeah, on AI, uh, I think I, I take most of my thoughts here from kind of other things rather than my, my work is um, the, the importance of ensuring that whatever, whatever models or technology we build and use from be it AI, ML, um, quantum, or the next phase of technology, um, making sure that we, we can have traceable outcomes, sensible traceable outcomes. That, that's some of the areas that, that sort of worry me. Now, I'm, I'm more worried from the perspective of lack of information, lack of knowledge. You know, I'm, an, I'm you know, getting older, I've been around for the bank for 20 years, I'm not, I'm not the new blood that's going to really understand this technology. Yeah. Um, I, I do enough, but so, so that's the first point. The second point is, from a, I'm a second line risk person, right? So my, my job is independent oversight and an element of assurance, as well as counsel and guidance. Um, so, so I've got to, I guess we've got to find our spot. It's not in the guts of, you know, what is the risk and the control. We can monitor and understand that. We've got to be the, be the folks seeing the blind spots. I get more worried about what's not written down than what is written down, frankly. So finding those things that the, the business in their pursuit of, of delivery and implementation and da da da, what are, what are the things that we can challenge on and actually step up, step back from and get the business as well. That's what I think our role from a risk management perspective needs to look like. So final closing remark on on your current view, and I suppose this is is somewhat leading to what we've talked about already about not not being able to manage what you don't know. Uh, is there an element more so than ever that, that it's the, it is still the fear of unknown and the pace of change that is kind of the, the hazy nagging doubt at the back of your mind? Is that is that a fair fair summary? I think it's healthy for a healthy, yes, yeah, sure, like sure. Healthy, we healthy should, dose we gets we should, be <laughs> yeah. we should be worried about the things that we're not yeah. seeing rather than be excited about the things yeah. that we are, and sometimes that's difficult. Yeah, I would say it's not so much the fear of the unknown. I, it's, it's actually, and this is me talking to the first line, it's the lack of fear of the unknown that worries me. <laughs> right? Very good point. Uh, Very good I mean, point. Fools rush in yeah. uh, where angels fear to tread. So uh, starting uh, offering a product without properly thinking it through, relocating an IT department without understanding the continuity aspects, yeah. all these lack of worry, um, professionally worry me. And I'm going to draw a close on, on that, that point because I think there's probably um, conversation over drinks for well into the early hours of the morning if we carry on. So um, I will open very quickly to the floor if anybody's got a burning question, otherwise I am conscious of time and I have the mic. Sorry, Prasad. Uh, Adrian, Judith, Mark... Brilliant session, and John, fabulous job in moderating. Uh, I want to, uh, not a question, but I want to say a few things. Uh, Mark, especially when you said um, the non-quantitative non risks don't get credit and, and don't get the right uh, audience or seat at the table with respect to market risk, credit risk, and treasury risk, right? So as a practitioner and as a technologist who has observed the practitioners over at least three decades, I can say that the qualitative aspects and the quantitative aspects go hand in hand. You can actually use the qualitative aspects to challenge the quantitative uh, measurements and, and conclusions and vice versa. I think that is, that is sorely missed, but people don't see that. Very experienced professionals in this space actually see that, the correlation between the two, and how you can draw upon both quantitative and qualitative aspects together to really manage the risks of the business. But very, very greatly narrated. Thank you. Right, maybe a very, very quick response to that. I've actually been in credit risk committees where we get a credit proposal, and the first and the most important question that was debated the longest was always, what is the soft side of this credit proposal? Right? What's the character of the management? What's the uh, behavioral aspects of the business that we are supposedly lending to? So it, it is acknowledged sometimes, but it deserves more attention. Yeah.
Hi, my name is Naokato from KPMG. So uh, Mr. Adrian uh, mentioned about operational resilience. So would you please share the, uh, how it's different <coughs> from uh, traditional risk management. It's more holistic and on a strategy. Strategic, uh, it's very strategic. So uh, could you please share how the operational resilience is, 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 is useful for the key risk trends and also new emerging risk like cyber, new tech uh, risk and like AI and uh, you know other you know emerging risk. I'll certainly have a go. Um, so 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 is it useful? Yes, it's, it's extremely useful. So it's quite the regulation is quite onerous. Okay, there's quite quite a lot to get stuck into with operational resilience. But what I think it's it's forcing firms to do, it's certainly forcing our firm to do in a positive sense, is really get under the skin of what are, are, what are our important business services, the, I, the IBS, as, as they say. So we've always, certainly in, 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 in Lloyd's, we've always had quite a clear view of what we used to call critical business services. So we had a lens of that. So we weren't completely standing start. So, so the first benefit is really understanding what are the important business services that impact our customers critically. You know, this is a lens, lens is all the way back to customers. Uh, and then the, the two further points, and, and a little bit of this came up earlier, actually, is the concept... or which from, from my money is a new concept around impact tolerance versus risk appetite. Um, and we, I think it was jo Joseph earlier on was talking a little bit about this, where we, have a, we can set a risk appetite, but our tolerance for that may be different. My risk appetite to get punched in the face is not very high at all, but I could probably tolerate one. Um, and the same is true for a lot of processes we operate in, in banks and other, and other firms as well. Having that understanding between um, uh, what are our important business services um, what are the uh, risk appetites for service and provision of those services? But then what are the tolerances we could reasonably expect um, to, to deal with it in a service outage, for example? And then wrap around that, again, some other things, I'm not talking new content here, uh, scenario planning, um, black swan testing, um, making sure we're testing things when the fire's not, not lit, when the, fire's, um, when the fire's off, as it were, to make sure we can recover from uh, events. And if the last bit of a broad and fluffy point, but if the last few years of life um, haven't taught us anything, it's, it's, you know, these black swan events seem to happen far more regularly than the books say they do, frankly. Um, so, so I think operational resilience as a, as a regulation is, is hard, but ultimately brilliant, in fact, for consumers. Um, and I think, you know, start it in financial services, but those, those broad principles uh, would apply really well in most, most industries, I would I don't know if there are operational resilience regulations elsewhere. I'm not, I'm not that clued up, I'm afraid. I hope that went some way towards answering. Not my immediate expertise. Right. I know, John, you and I are sharing a mic at the moment, so tell me when you need it back. Okay. Hello. Um, I, I wanted to ask the panel, um, you commented on the risk management not being taken seriously enough by risk takers. Um, do you think that is uh, because there isn't a, a strong enough link back to strategic objectives, uh, strategy and how impact, uh, how, you know, risk impacts on the overall strategic direction of, of the company and what it's trying to achieve? Um, how well do you think that aspect is being is being covered, um, you know, by the risk. Yeah, how well it's being covered off. The risk takers. Yes. Yeah. Well, in in a way, it's a bit more simple than that. Um, I I feel that, and and what I see happening is that non-financial risk isn't isn't forcing themselves upon the risk takers. They're quite happy to you know have their own little cottage industry create their reports, do their assessments, kick out a KRI, and, and, and leave it at that. They're not really trying very, very hard to, get, to become part of the decision-making process. They're very busy at gathering data, and we all know that's really, really hard, and quantitative data is even harder to present well, but they're not doing their utmost to get at the table. I mean, we, we don't get knocks on the door for the credit committee. To, uh, by the non-financial risk people to say, you know, we need to be there. Or perhaps in, 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 the, in, the, in, in the only area where I've see, really seen that happen a lot is in mergers and acquisitions, where I have seen that done. 
Uh, but otherwise, they, they're not forcing themselves. So I would, and with a challenge to all the non-financial risk professionals here, to say, make sure that you get a seat at the table. And you, you, you're never invited in, of course. You need to knock on the door yourself and, and say, you know, I, I need to be there. I need to be there when decisions are made on, let's say, client segmentation or uh, new product offerings, not as a, as a process, but uh, new, new products when they're being discussed prior to even offering them... Uh, Offering them out, so just just force yourself upon the uh, on these guys. I mean, they're um, they're ignoring you because we're not knocking hard enough on the doors. I, I would add to that as someone who's relatively new to risk. Uh, I think it's not just a question of knocking on doors. Okay. I think it's a question of articulating the Correct. value. Mm -hmm. Why do you need a risk mm -hmm. lens? Yes. What what do, what do we bring to the table? Articulating that very well, articulating the value of that very well. I think mm -hmm. there's a danger of us talking to ourselves. Um, there's a danger of us talking in jargon that um, makes it difficult to understand what we bring to the table. So I think we have a job to do, not just to mm -hmm. get into the room, but no, you have to, have but something to, to articulate say. the value and, and to yeah. help not only the top, but also middle management, to understand the value of... Yes, of, I, I, I totally agree. ...having risk at the table as part of decisions. No, I, you, I spot on. Yeah. We, we have a big job to do that. Yeah, spot on, yeah. I'll speak to you later. I've got some more thoughts as well. We're out of time. Yeah. Great. Yeah, everyone's flashing red things out the back. Yeah, look... <laughs> Talk very close, or shall I just say thank you very much, panelists? You're that welcome. was awesome. And John.